My name is Scott Butler. I am the Fresh Executive Director for the Ontario Good Roads Association. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone here. We have a, an august panel talking about a topic that is uh, unusually timely for a number of different reasons, and I'll let them get into that. Um, two groups were responsible primarily for, for helping realize this. Frank Cowan Company, who has been a longtime supporter of OGRA and the municipal sector more broadly, uh, was critical as was, and get, correct me, Jamie, if I, if I mess this up, the Ontario Road Safety Infrastructure Group. Coalition. Coalition. Ah, it was so close. I knew it. You it. Bobbled it. Um, who have been looking at ways to improve road safety uh, through design, through technology, uh, a whole host of things. And we're going to cover a lot of ground where they'll dive into this. Um, this would not have been possible without without the efforts of those two groups. And uh, you know, uh, if you find this meaningful, by all means, uh, take a moment to uh, extend your appreciation to them. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I think the program's really simple. I'm going to introduce Jamie West from Orsic, and she's going to run through uh, some formal introductions here, and. Mm -hmm. We'll turn over the program to our panelists. Uh, if there's time permitting, uh, there, there is at the bottom of the, uh, of the Zoom application, there's a chat function and there's a Q&A module. You can post questions to us that way. You can do it through the chat function. Um, I, as we, those of you who were on earlier, um, can ask Charles if he's replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we'd prefer if you kept it, you know, more oriented on the road safety aspect. Uh, that would be great. And as I said, timely, we as an organization have been prioritizing road safety and reimagining what's possible from the perspective of ensuring everyone using the roadway is safe, but in a backhanded way of also addressing some of the liability concerns our municipal members have had. Uh, we believe the best lawsuit to win is the one you never have to enter. So... Uh, this is a continuation of these advocacy efforts we've taken for the last little while, and we're really looking forward to learning some more about this. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Jamie to introduce the panelists. I will visually recuse myself here and pull up the presentations. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we just want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day to join us for what we hope is a very insightful look into the world of roadside safety. Um, as Scott said, my name is Jamie West. I represent Peninsula Construction, and we are members of ORSIC. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank the OGRA and Frank Cowan Company for hosting today's session and allowing us to bring together what we think are some of the great leaders in the field of road safety. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, all the participants will be muted during the webinar, but we encourage you guys to post all your questions and we will do our best at the end of the presentation, if there is time, to answer some of the questions. So let's get started with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dean Alberson, um, who has served most of his career with Texas A&M Transportation Institute. But he recently retired, and since retiring from TTI, he is serving as a consultant with Bulwark Design Innovations, um, to private sector entities that want to save lives through highway safety and physical security. Anybody that knows Dean knows his passion for, is contagious, and he demonstrates a broad, sorry, he has a passion for new things and has demonstrated broad success in developing new research areas and new products with individuals across Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Please welcome to the webinar, Dean. Thanks, Jamie. It's, uh, it's good to be with you guys, and I look forward to, to sharing some of the fun videos that I get to, to deal with on a regular basis. So when Scott gets that pulled up, we'll get going. Yeah, it's just giving me some difficulties here, Dean. One sec. I'm not sure why it's doing this. Is that up? You can see that? Yes. 
Are you seeing the version with the notes on the side or are you seeing the full screen? Uh, I have a split screen that has uh, Jamie and all our pictures on the right side. Right, there we go. Now there. we're back. To, yeah. Back to all the videos. Oh, I was seeing the speaker notes. There we go. There we go. Lord George. All righty. So what I want to spend a little time talking about is the uh, history of crash testing um, in the U.S., North America, really in the world. Uh, next slide, please. And that's a little bit about me. Jamie already talked about it. I have been in crash testing since 1992, and uh, it's a terrible job, but somebody has to do it. So I stepped up the plate, and, and I've been crashing cars. So I've never had to grow up my entire life. Next slide, please. So let's differentiate between physical security testing and um, highway safety testing. So hopefully if this runs, this is a neat test. This was done for Department of Energy and you should never be seeing this video because this was controlled information, but this was to keep big vehicles out of nuclear facilities. And uh, so that's a 65,000 pound truck and we really didn't care whether we saved their lives. As a matter of fact, from a legal standpoint, it's probably better that we not save their lives. Um, when they're trying to kill people on the other side of that. Next slide, please. So this is compared to highway safety. The one on the left is partial to, to me because that's one I helped invent. That's called the soft stop. And you see the difference in the collision. Those vehicles are traveling about the same speed. The one on the right is an SKT. And uh, whenever you run into those, we expect to save your lives. That's what we're doing. And so it's, it's a controlled deceleration. And uh, that's what roadside safety is. Next slide, please. Back in the day, <laughs> this was kind of fun. Back in the 30s, Missouri Department of Transportation, they didn't use tow guidance. They used wheel ruts and sent old Model Ts into wire ropes. Interesting to note that these wire ropes are of the same construction that we use today for the three quarter inch, three strand, seven wire strand crash tests. And uh, just fun to watch. But uh, this was done by Missouri DOT back in the day. And, they, and there's all these different systems that they're running into. It's important to note that all the engineers are standing around and looking at everything and all the other guys are doing all the work. So you can see that two cables didn't work back then and it generally doesn't work today. We generally need three or four cables to capture the broad range of vehicles that run into it. We're gonna talk about that. Next slide, please. So, this started way back in the 60s, really. Uh, you see there was first a circular in 1962. There was an update in 73 with uh, NCHI report 153. It went to a 16-page document. You can see the document kept getting bigger. 230 was really the first big one that had a lot of information in it and was what I first started working under uh, at TTI back in the early 90s. Right after I got there, report 350 came out, and most people are probably most familiar with that because uh, it's been around for a long time and uh, a lot of information put out about it. The uh, last standard or the most recent standard is MASH, first came out in 2009 and was updated to uh, 2016 where we did a little more looking at cable uh, cable barrier test matrices. And I'm going to go into a little more detail on uh, 350 and MASH in some of these next slides. Next slide, please. So the... Uh, there's the 2009 and the 2016 MASH for um, assessing safety hardware. Probably some of the biggest change, we increase both the small car and the pickup because all our vehicles just keep getting bigger. And uh, we couldn't find small enough cars to run into this. And this is quite a contrast to the European Union. They've still got the smaller 1800 pound vehicles in their standard compared to our standard. We also changed everything to be 25 degrees. If you go back to some of the old standards, some of the small cars first started out at 15 degrees. We increased to 20 degrees in, I believe, 230. And then under MASH, we've uh, changed everything to reflect the same thing. We figure you can, if you can run it to 25 degrees in a pickup, you probably can do it in a small car. So we're <coughs> testing at a lower angle for uh, different vehicles. And they had their reasons, but I think it's better that we've now gone to a consistent testing. Next slide, please. I'm gonna, uh, I've already talked about it, let's go on. So here's a, a, a description of the test matrices and what's going on. So we have all these different test levels. 350 brought us the extra higher test levels with 
Tesla to four pickups, five pick. I'm sorry, four trucks, six trucks, seven, six trucks. Four is like a U-Haul class of vehicle. A Tesla level five is like a box trailer. And then Tesla level six is with tanker trucks. And then we have all these different speeds that we run things at. And you can see some of the different angles back in the old 350. Next slide, please. So how do you decide what to run a test on? We, we've got all these different vehicles out there on the highway and we've got all these different speed limits and we've got, um, old cars, new cars, and how do we decide what to, to test at? And we've been increasing our speed limits. We got nice big open areas. We got pretty rock escarpments that we don't really want to get rid of. And we don't want to block off the view for the lake. And then sometimes we just got ditches and other things and other hazards beside there. So how do we decide what to test? So our general rule has always been, and still is today, a 90th percentile on vehicle uh, types. We look for max vehicle sales, but we look at speeds and encroachment angles and, and things of that nature to help us establish what we can test. We, we could capture everything, but you wouldn't be able to afford it. So we generally go to the 90th percentile on um, speed and angle, and then we've gone to a half ton pickup quad cab, which also ties into sport utility vehicles. Next slide, please. As I said before, we increased all of them to go to 25 degrees. And then we also increased the TL4 truck weight and speed. Before, under 350, the TL4 was not a very discriminating test. It was very similar to a TL3 pickup in impact severity. So under MASH, we increased those. Next slide, please. Here are some differences you can see visually between the old 350 and MASH vehicles. Uh, the Kia, and then we can't even buy the Kias in that class anymore. And now we've kind of gone to a Nissan or a Hyundai that looked like that picture uh, on the left. So again, our cars keep getting heavier. And uh, so we just have to change our standard to reflect what's on there. And we don't forget about all the old cars, but we still think, well, we got to keep moving forward. We can't, we can't just stay with the old stuff. New, next slide, please. This is a great shot. So this is like a 59 Bel Air to a 2009 Malibu. And it's gonna show you a couple of videos of the interior. When they say you, they don't build cars like they used to, thank God. So in this car, you can see on the inside what happens to the occupant. Now pay attention to the occupant in the Malibu. Airbags, restraints, and everything else. And the occupant compartment is still almost completely intact where the old Bel Air is just destroyed. So a, a great comparison. So they've done a lot to help our safety, but we'd like to think we've contributed by the way we're improving road safety. Next slide, please. Look at the difference between these pickups. And, and this isn't a lifted pickup. This isn't anything out of the order. That's a run of the mill production Dodge pickup compared to an old three quarter ton uh, heavy pickup on the left. So they've gotten taller and heavier. And uh, we actually have a requirement to be at minimum 28 inches CG height on a Dodge pickup to be able to even run the test. So we have to measure vertical CG. Next slide, please. There is a reflection from 20 degrees under the old 350. Next slide, please. And we also used to test at 15 degrees. We have since learned that on some of those compression terminals, there's some other angles out there. Uh, and it was brought probably to the forefront by litigation that somewhere between five and 15 is, a, is more of a severe case. And so we then try to determine where to test between five and 15 degrees instead of straight up 15. Next slide, please. We also didn't used to test with pickups. And um, we used to think if the small car is okay, the pickup's okay. Well, this higher profile and taller vehicle is, is messing with us. So next slide, please. When you watch this video, you'll see also we sometimes we want to put signs down low on the on the post and that changes the whole rotational moment of inertia and so then uh, we have a real potential to put the upper part of the sign into the pickup so we now must test small sign sports with pickups and cars next slide please there's what i was talking about the discrimination under the old nchrp you see the red line the impact severity was not any different for an old TL4 truck under MASH. We've increased the speed and the weight. And so it's a little more discriminating test. And just to prove it, we ran the next slide, please. The, uh, the MASH TL4 truck. Whoa, back up one. We skipped one there. We, uh, 
ran the new MASH TL4 truck into a barrier that passed under NCHRP report 350. Uh-oh, says it cannot play the playback. Anyway, this slide would have shown you that this vehicle overtops a typical 32 inch barrier and we now recommend that all bridge rails move to 36 inches. So that's it in a nutshell on where we've come and where we're going with uh, highway safety testing. And if there's time at the end, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Next slide, it's kind of fun. We also tested semis into simulated bridge piers mm -hmm. and we changed the design loads um, that we put into those columns for bridges based on that test right there. There was load cells measuring the load. And uh, anyway, crazy fun, the work I get to do. Glad I got to share it with you. Have a great day, thanks. Thank, thanks, Dean. Um, thanks for that great overview of the history and evolution of crash testing, which will lead us to our next speaker, who's going to talk to us about the current state of road safety devices and someone that probably most of us are familiar with. Mark Eaton is a licensed professor, professional engineer in Ontario with over three decades of highway design and construction experience. Mark is a technical expert on geometric and roadside safety design with the Ontario Ministry of Transportation, and he is now with Safe Roads Engineering. Mark continues to apply his technical expertise on engineering projects and technical training. Welcome to the webinar, Mark. Thanks, Jamie. Hopefully I'm coming in okay. Uh, you'll probably hear some background construction noise here. I've got a window crew replacing uh, windows here and they're on time and material right now so I'm not stopping them. So let's, uh, I'm going to be talking about common aging and deficient devices on the municipal road network. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about status of roadside safety standards in Ontario, deficiencies versus deviations from standards, some innovative uh, solutions, and roadside safety asset condition assessments. Next. So the status of roadside safety in Ontario, MTO is a leading road authority in North America for implementation of new roadside safety hardware that meets the crash test acceptance criteria of MASH that Dean just described. MTO implemented type M20 and M30 steel beam guide rail back in May of 2016. That was a full 19 months in advance of, of the uh, agreement that was established in the U.S. Uh, through FHWA and AASHTO that MTO was uh, part of in setting up that, uh, that schedule. In um, September, September 2016, MTO implemented um, steel beam guide rail terminals at MetMASH and that was a full 23 months in advance of the, uh, of the schedule for MASH implementation. High tension cable guide rail was implemented for roadside by MTO in December 2016, two years in advance of the schedule. So again, we were uh, ahead of the curve and we, uh, at least on provincial highway contracts, we were implementing pro um, new hardware as soon as it became available and uh, cost effective to install. Through MTO's involvement with the Ontario Provincial Standards for Roads and Public Works, which I think uh, most people on the call are familiar with, is MTO shares the standards that um, we were using and we shared them with the OPS Traffic Safety Committee for their review and consideration before and being published by OPS for municipal use on municipal contracts. Implementation of new MASH hardware is well underway by municipalities by specifying the applicable OPSS and OPSDs in their contract. Examples include OPSS Muni 721 from November 18 for steel beam guide rail that gives the designer the choice of using 350 or MASH hardware, and OPSS Muni 732 from November 19 for MASH steel beam energy attenuating terminals. Solving the issue on when to replace upgrade aging roadside hardware is, is the challenge right now. Next slide. Deficiency versus deviation from standard. So a, defi a deficiency can be defined as a roadside safety device is deficient if it no longer meets the standard specification or manufacturer's installation instructions to which it was originally installed. Deficiencies can be due to a variety of factors, including hardware age, traffic impacts, 
for W-beam systems, steel beam guide rail, they can be categorized into three tiers, which was set through NCHRP report 656 in two, 2010. They include a high, which is a second impact results in unacceptable safety performance, including barrier penetration and or vehicle rollover, medium. A second impact with that damaged system it will not will not result in an unacceptable safety performance. And then a low, a low severity is a second impact results results in no discernible difference in performance from the undamaged barrier. So a, a W beam system can take a lot of abuse out there, but when there's certain things that happen, for example, like a perforation, it really is a high priority to get out and uh, and do a repair. Deviation from standards. That can be defined as a roadside safety device that was modified or installed not according to the standard specification or manufacturer's instructions. And we've got some examples coming up. Next slide. So common deficiencies and deviations. So there's a list there, uh, low or high cable W-beam systems, loose cables. I've been out on a few jobs lately where I, I just can't believe the lack of attention in some of the systems out there. Leaning W-beam cable guide rail, and we're going to show you some pictures. On the deviation side, I'm really starting to see a lot of modifications either being done by designers, uh, and that's provincially and uh, uh, municipals, uh, municipal projects, consultants, and basically modifications to OPSDs that we're having a hard time understanding how they were modified and whether they would even function um, if hit under the same crash test to which these systems were originally designed. Next slide. So just some examples here up at the top, top left, efficient grading. So there's a, an older eccentric loader. You've got the soil plate sticking out of the, out of the slope. I mean, basically a vehicle were to run into that, he's gonna try and get underneath that system and that barrel is gonna be coming through the windshield. We've got uh, leaning, uh, W-beam system in the bottom left. We've got an eccentric loader there in the middle where it's not sitting on the chairs, it's not supported, it's not gonna function properly. You can see at the bottom there, the leaning cable guide rail and there's absolutely no tension in that system whatsoever. And then we've got a low W-beam system, only like 21 inches high. Um, and we're gonna show you a couple crash tests right now. Next slide, please. So here's a test here of a, of a MASH uh, TL3 test, 5,000 pound uh, pickup truck, 27 inch mounting height, and that's basically the old 350 type uh, type hardware. And then we've got a mash test with a 31 inch mounting height, and that was your M, uh, M20 system, I believe it was. So you can see the difference in performance there. Now, one thing to remember that these are severe tests. Uh, Dean was mentioning, you know, we're trying to pick like a worst case scenario. These represent probably about a 93, 94th percentile type impact where the majority of your impacts are gonna be less than that. But this is how we, uh, so we can compare apples and apples and oranges and oranges when we're looking at different systems. Next slide, please. So these are some tests that were done over in Sweden. The one on the left is here's a, a W-beam system where it's got a slope of uh, 18 degrees. Uh, it's out of, out of plumb. You can see where the vehicle rolled over it. And the one on the right, I don't know if that's any better. I mean, yes, you stayed on the right side of the road, but you ended up going into a roll. So both are, are failed tests. Next slide, please. Structure connections. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of problems with these out here. Top left, that's where when it was installed, they emitted a bunch of posts. It's critical on structure connections that we start to make the, the W-beam system more rigid before it ties into the concrete. Down on the bottom, you'll see a lack of working width where that pole is almost touching the, the W-beam system. Basically, if you were running into that system before the pole, you're probably gonna be redirected into the pole. You wouldn't even have a chance of even missing it at that point. Modified leaving ends, I'm seeing a lot of these in, in the top right. That, that system just will not function. I believe some folks thought that this would be a much cheaper option than putting a steel beam terminal on the end. Uh, bottom center, I'm starting to see a lot of these. Uh, this is actually on an MTO project where they're putting these big obelisks on the end. I think it's all tied in with trying to make a cycling rail, but 
that system there creates a very rigid uh, point. You are going to snag if you were to run into that system on that vertical concrete wall. Entrance treatments, that's something that is just causes uh, so much trouble. I know that standard has been uh, canceled by OPS due to the amount of abuse, but you can just see that system there. It's just going to fold in on itself in the bottom. And this is one I took yesterday. This is of a square lock post where these systems are shipped with, uh, you know, quarter bolts. Um, and for whatever reason, someone goes out and buys a new grade five bolts, puts it straight through. That bottom uh, post should only project out of the ground less than four inches. And I'm seeing these all over the place. The systems are sold. That's a 350 system, but they're sold with corner bolts. And I see no reason why they're not being installed in accordance with the standard. Next slide, please. This is a test we did with the OPP. Uh, that concrete barrier and behind the entrance treatment, that was to simulate a rigid obstacle, such as a hydro pole. Notice the left end of that W beam, it just releases. There's no anchorage there. And this is what we're seeing a lot with this system. We've got people modifying it. This is supposed to go way down the entrance and be properly anchored. If it's not, it's not going to work. Next slide, please. Here's a test of a system, low tension cable next to a one and a half to one slope. Again, these are very severe impact angles, 25 degrees. It's highly unlikely you'd be able to achieve that on a very narrow two lane road. And the bottom was a structure connection where if you don't put those additional posts in there, that vehicle just wraps itself around the concrete and comes to an abrupt stop. Next slide, please. So some of the new innovation solutions that are coming along, blockless W-beam systems, these were recently put into the MTO roadside design manual that was updated just this past May. That system is in there now, and I know they're publishing their standards later this fall. We've also got some systems for pedestrian railing attachments to uh, W-beam systems, motorcycle protection systems, post caps for pedestrian protection. And these new systems have a much narrower profile and can be installed right next to a two to one slope with shallower posts. Next slide, please. Key resources that everybody who's doing design should be familiar with. It's the MTO Roadside Design Manual. Again, just recently updated the TAC Geometric Design Guide Chapter 7 on Roadside Safety and CHRP Report 656. Of course, the OPS standards. And always make sure when you're putting in proprietary systems that you are following the manufacturer's instructions and working drawings. Safe Roads Engineering team, we're, we're here to assist regions and municipalities with respect to anything dealing with roadside safety, roadside safety hardware. Next slide, please. I think this is just a, it's a shameless plug for Safe Roads Engineering. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for a great overview of the now on our road. I believe we're going to pass it along now to Will Longstreet on what's what's coming up, what the future looks like. Uh, Will Longstreet has had over 30 years of experience in roadside safety in the U.S., both at P Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and with the Federal Highway Administration Office of Safety. While at PennDOT, Will was charged with maintaining crashworthiness of PennDOT standards including serving on Texas A&M Transportation Institute State Pooled Fund. Will joined the FHWA Office of Safety in 2008, and Will is now assigned to the Northern IP Research and Development Team developing and crash testing new and innovative highway safety products. Welcome to the webinar, Will. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here this afternoon. Again, my name is Will Longstreet. On behalf of the Northern Infrastructure Products, I welcome you to this segment of today's presentation. It's, a part, it's certainly a privilege and an honor today to be speaking to you all. Next slide, please. A little bit about what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon. A lot of it dovetails into uh, Dean Alberson and uh, Mark Ayton, my colleagues uh, here in the Working in Canada in regards to uh, how training then fits into all of this. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Northern Infrastructure Products, uh, some of the challenges uh, municipalities uh, face, which will be uh, old news to everyone here. Uh, a lot of hardware identification, documentation methods, training programs, especially uh, 
that which is being currently offered in the United States under the FAST Act uh, program uh, and why training is so critical right now. Next slide, please. So a little bit about Northern Inf Infrastructure is a highway safety products company established in 2018 based in Ontario, Canada. Uh, the mandate of Northern Infrastructure Products is to identify and reduce the severity associated with roadway departures via innovative design solutions and working with road authorities, designers, and contractors to identify, analyze, and solve a broad spectrum of roadside safety needs. Um, next slide, please. Some of the challenges, uh, obvious to, uh, to many of the municipalities, um, first and foremost would just be um, funding uh, the cost uh, to certainly a ch challenge to maintain your roads. Uh, and that is, uh, also includes the roadside safety product installed uh, that, that are still necessary. Uh, is what you have out on your, on your roadways still viable? Is it still doing what it should be doing? And what's it there for? Sometimes these old installations were there, they were protecting something that had once been there, uh, such as a pole or an obstruction that had been removed. Uh, in many cases, uh, the guardrail still, still remains. So we, we really need to also understand that um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it is important uh, to also consider removal of the guardrail as well, uh, particularly if you've got really good run out uh, beyond that point. Um, have the installers and the maintenance crews received and documented the appropriate training? Um, have the processes been put in place that track, document installations and maintenance activities? And some of the internal personnel changes, uh, including uh, folks that retire and also the new people coming in. Um, and a lot of this really is the challenges of some of the common deficiencies and deviations as per Mark's presentation here. Um, just a quick note on the RDG that Mark had touched on. Um, shielding obstacles is actually number five when it comes into the top six, uh, when it comes to uh, what uh, municipalities and or states should, uh, should, uh, should do. First and foremost would be remove the obstacle. Second, redesign the obstacle so it can be easily traversed. Third, relocate the obstacle to a point where it's less likely to be struck. Fourth is reduce the impact severity by specifying the appropriate breakaway device. Number five, shield the, shield the uh, obstacle with longitudinal barrier. And number six, if none of these are available, then you go to more of a delineation portion. Next slide, please. Again, uh, just something to understand here, the limitations, the appropriateness of, of site conditions. Uh, as both Dean and Mark have pointed out, we're into that 90th percentile. Uh, what's out there isn't going to work for every possible situation. So here you see a vehicle hitting this barrier at a 90 degree angle. Um, that's not something we typically test when it comes to roadside safety hardware. This is more State Department, as Dean had uh, alluded to in his earlier presentation. Next slide, please. Some of the hardware identification and documentations here. Um, when you, when you come out to, uh, to ensure that the roadside safety hardware is documented appropriately, uh, staff at the minimum must have a basic roadside safety hardware knowledge. Um, and the competent employee should be able to identify each type of product, um, including those types of systems that are currently being specified on the plan and that which they are out inspecting. Uh, so there are resources available for this, for this particular aspect. Um, <coughs> I was with the uh, Federal Highway Administration. We did, there was a number of resources that we had pulled together uh, for the states that would be more of a generic uh, standardized type of resources that we can certainly um, uh, make available to those on today's presentation as well. Next slide, please. Training programs, uh, particular to the uh, State Department experience, and this would be in the United States. Um, two states come to mind, Utah and Indiana. Uh, they have got a, a very robust program installed in their states. Uh, what they do is they train uh, their inspectors and people that are out installing um, on a regular basis. This is on a frequency of about two years. Each two, every two years, you have to go back in and get, get recertified. Um, the, uh, the types of, types of uh, uh, things that they do is uh, not only give the training, but they give an exam at the end. 
and they also give some type of identification card to be carried by all the people out in the field so that when the state or the municipalities uh, in this case would go out and make an inspection of, of an installation, they'd be able to canvas the people out doing the actual job and check them to see whether or not they've had, they've had the proper training to be installing the device that they are currently working with. Uh, that certainly has worked. Utah has been uh, has been one of the one of the leaders. Um, they have a they have a great success there. So there really wouldn't be any question as far as the uh, abilities of people out putting the installation in. Years ago, uh, when I was with Pennsylvania, uh, of course, this still doesn't exist in the state of Pennsylvania, to my knowledge. Is uh, that this was this was very this was done on basically just the, are you familiar with the device? Yes, I am, and the installer would go out and put it in. Uh, most cases, you'd have some type of discrepancy in the installation, and uh, that's not the time to be finding problems for sure. So there are different things that you can do in training uh, to to avoid these types of uh, these type of, uh, discrepancies. Um, so frequent training. Uh, ensures that proper installation of the roadside safety devices, and it's very, very important to to, to make that uh, make that statement clear today. Next slide, please. Some of the background here on the Fast Act program. Um, this was fixing America's surface transportation. Um, Congress uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, did pass a mandate in this law for the training uh, of uh, those of roadside safety devices when it comes to both designers and uh, inspectors. And this was really at the behest of the international trade associations and nonpartisan federations, uh, such as uh, AGC and ARPA and um, ATSA. It also was came from the state end of things as well, uh, which would be ASHTO. Um, so th this, was, this was definitely something that was, that was in the works. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on that contract and to manage that. Uh, we developed um, specified training or uh, tailored training for each specific state because each state would have a different, uh, different cadre of different uh, uh, roadside safety hardware. So it was important that we had to tailor that to what they were using. Um, and as uh, both of my previous uh, uh, presenters had mentioned today, there's uh, so many uh, new innovative devices out there now that, that have to be installed in a certain way. And you have to be very much on top of your game when it comes to installation and making sure that these uh, devices are installed as they were tested and or as per manufacturer's recommendations. Um, so there is much offered in the U.S. Uh, regarding the local government's training that may become useful uh, to Ontario. Uh, more on these and other aspects of the FAST Act later, I'm sure. Next slide, please. So why training now? Um, certainly the newer testing criterion as uh, Dean has pointed out earlier, uh, biggest ones here are the changes in the vehicle fleet. Um, and we do, we, we, we certainly keep an eye on what's been in the past and making sure that we're also uh, canvassing those, those earlier type of vehicles when it comes to uh, the crashworthiness of these devices. It's also looking into the future and or what's being, what's being developed now. Um, there has been some, some uh, uh, aspects as far as the trends go and heavier vehicles. Um, and uh, that has actually helped us in a lot of ways. Uh, crush points, uh, the other the aspect of looking at those two older, one older vehicle versus the new vehicle that Dean had shown. Uh, so vehicles have really come a long way, particularly with the uh, occupant uh, impact velocities and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So choosing the right training path, this is, and, and this is certainly something that every state has struggled, this, uh, struggled with. Uh, training first and foremost, it broadens that knowledge base, the techs, the engineers, the inspectors, both old and new. Uh, your training should have something in there for everyone, uh, being that the, 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 the testing criteria is changing. Uh, the types of devices are changing, they're becoming a little more complex. Uh, that's, that's enough for both, particularly the folks that have been out there inspecting for such a long time. So it really is, the training is just, it, honestly, for everyone. But if you really want to boil this down into the, into the tailored aspects to fit the needs, 
uh, this particular slide shows both uh, engineer, designer, inspector training, and of course, installation and maintenance. Uh, I found in the United States, with the installation and maintenance was very, very critical to also include some of the design training as well, just so that they understand uh, the reasons behind the device and how the device was, uh, was supposed to uh, perform appropriately. So it is, it is very important uh, that, that you include that. But you have an introductory program, which it could, be, it could be nothing more than just a prerequisite. Uh, and then going on to something that could be certif certified would be your design and inspection and, of course, maintenance as well. Next slide, please. So in, 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 in all aspects here, um, as the slide indicates, know your assets and understand how they're tested. Uh, training is, it is essential. Uh, it is very important that you have people that understand the devices that they are specifying and, of course, the devices that they are installing and then the devices that they are, that they are maintaining. Um, and it's important that, uh, that these devices not only be installed appropriately, uh, but they're also maintained appropriately out in the field. So the training can certainly get, lend itself to municipalities to ensure that these devices are being installed and maintained appropriately. That's all I have for today, and I thank you very much for your, for your time. Thanks, Will. Uh, it's really important for us to understand that training is important, and I think it's coming down in the near future, and uh, it leads perfectly into our last speaker, Charles Painter. Charles has been a partner with Patterson McDougall since 2012. Since being called to the bar, he has focused on and practiced exclusively in the areas of personal injury, insurance defense, and municipal liability. Charles has published numerous papers, case comments, and articles on municipal law, and has presented on topics of interest at the Canadian Institute on Provincial Municipal Government Liability, and for the Society of Professional Insurance Adjusters of Ontario. Welcome to the webinar, Charles. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, here virtually with us. Um, so, I'm going to finish off by uh, picking up where the last speaker left off, and before we start going through my slides, which is this, as a municipal defense lawyer who's handled, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of cases where the allegation is a failure to maintain the highway in a reasonable state of repair, and that includes signage, guide rails, safety equipment, traffic control systems, you name it. The training of the maintenance and installation staff always comes up. One of the first things that the plaintiff's lawyers who sue want to know is who were the people involved in inspecting and maintaining the equipment? If it's relatively new equipment, it'll be who installed it. And if it's a contractor, they want to know all about them and what were their qualifications and experience? What did the municipality do to ensure that the people that they were sending out to perform these important tasks knew what they were doing? And so we get all kinds of requests at, on discovery in the lead up to any trial for all sorts of training and education certificates. So um, it goes without saying that while it's important to do for the purposes of doing the job right, from a legal standpoint, it's also important because if you can't prove that the people who are doing the job were properly trained and there's a problem with what was out there, well, let's just put it bluntly, it doesn't look good and it makes the job that I have to do as your lawyer much, much harder. So I wanna talk about the law regarding guide rails and guardrails. That's been one of the main topics of the presentation today. Um, and I'm gonna do that now. So we can go to the next slide, please, Scott. So. We live in a very litigious society, and I don't think I have to tell anyone listening that municipalities are targets. You've got hundreds of kilometers of road, hundreds of kilometers of sidewalk typically. Accidents happen, people wanna make money, plaintiff's lawyers are on TV advertising. So <laughs> as Oliver Wendell Holmes was quoted when he was a judge, this is a court of law, young man, not a court of justice. And Law school taught Hart's Pomerantz one thing, which is how to take two situations that are exactly the same and show how they are different. 
which is another fancy way of saying that lawyers are the ones causing all the trouble. So now that I've admitted that truth, let's move on to the next slide. The legal duty, as you know, is to maintain your highways under the Municipal Act. So this is non-negotiable. Everything within the limits of the road allowance, you have to legally maintain. That comes from the province of Ontario through Section 44 of the Municipal Act. You must keep it in a state of repair that is reasonable, and that includes anything you install, guide rails, guardrails, traffic signs, all of it from one edge of the invisible road allowance to the other, not just the traveled portion of the highway, necessarily. You have defenses under the Negligence Act. Let's go to the next slide. And under the Municipal Act, Section 44.3, it says you can prove that you're not negligent if you didn't know and you could not reasonably have been expected to know about the state of repair of the highway. That is exceedingly rare that you can throw up your hands and say, I had no idea that the thing that was allegedly wrong was wrong. This defense under 44.3a is the unexpected winter storm defense, the flash freeze that wasn't forecast. Before we could do anything to get ahead of the problem, we couldn't do anything. I suppose in the context of a guardrail claim, it could be that the guardrail was taken out by a truck and damaged, and then the next car that came along crashed into it, and the injuries were very severe because it was already damaged and in a state of disrepair before you knew about it. But I'm going to guess that the chances of a claim like that coming along and being pursued um, are going to be very rare. So the I didn't know defense of 443A, not often going to help. 44, let's, yeah, 443B, Scott's jumping at. 443B is the one where we win most, if not all, of our claims. It took reasonable steps to prevent the default from arising. Maintenance, repair, and inspection, and proper installation is 443B in the context of a lawsuit claiming failure to install or repair or inspect safety equipment and infrastructure along your highway. Reasonableness is based on complying with leading industry standards and guidelines. Leading industry standards and guidelines are not the law, but they might as well be because they inform what a judge is going to find to be a reasonable standard. In other words, if you are not complying with leading industry guidelines and, 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 and recommendations, you better be in a position to explain why not. Why didn't you will be the question when there are clearly defined guidelines and standards available and experts available to advise you, right? So, reasonable steps. The third defense is the minimum standards defense. So, 44.3c on this slide, this is the only other legal defense a municipality can raise to a claim of something wrong with the road, is at the time of the lawsuit, when the cause of action arose, meaning when the car accident happened, most often, minimum standards established under this section apply to the highway or to the bridge, because bridges are included, and to the alleged state of disrepair, and those standards have been met. Now, guide rails or guardrails are not included yet in the MMS, but a number of other things are, such as luminaires, right? Such as traffic control signal systems and their control systems, and signage. Retroreflectivity standards apply and have to be, there has to be annual testing. So the regulation uh, under, the, under the Municipal Act, which is called the Minimum Maintenance Standards for Municipal Highways, will cover some of the things that we've been talking about today, but unfortunately not yet guardrails or guide rails. Next slide, please. It's important for everyone listening to understand that the law has evolved. We used to be under an event-based system of liability. Keep going back, Scott. <laughs> Stay on this slide. Thank you. So the event-based system of liability says, you used to be liable for things that happened and then how fast you responded. In other words, a judge would look at the state of disrepair, 
how soon did you know about it? And then how quickly did you fix it after you found out whatever was wrong? Now, the courts apply a risk-based analysis, which is what were you doing to prevent the thing from happening in the first place? What did you do to mitigate the risk of harm to the traveling public? In a snow and ice case, I've often raised this um, to demonstrate that you're supposed to be looking at the forecast. You're not supposed to wait until the roads get icy. You're supposed to look at the forecast, look into your crystal ball, predict the future, I guess, somewhat, and get out there ahead of the game. Well, the same thing goes for infrastructure, in fact, even more so, because unlike a weather forecast, you can go out and take a look at what your hardware is like. You can go out and measure and assess your road safety equipment and pretty easily know before a car accident or an injury happens whether it's deficient or not. And it's that risk-based theory of liability that judges love to impose that it should be giving you a little bit of heartburn at night. It certainly does for me because it's very easy with 2020 hindsight for judges to, to say, no, you should have done more. If you're not doing anything, then you have a big problem. So it's going to be a test of risk-based analysis for you and any lawsuit for your road safety equipment. Was it installed originally properly? And after that, did you look after it and maintain it to a reasonable standard? Perfection is still, thank goodness, not the standard, but reasonableness is. And unfortunately, plaintiffs hire very sneaky experts who keep raising the bar of reasonableness closer to perfection. Um, the point is, you don't want to just wing it. You've got to have a response. And that response has to be based on sound practices, based on objective standards and guidelines that can be readily pointed to. Next slide, please. Now, here's a fun little bit. This is the fun part of my presentation, the untraveled portion of the highway. Under Section 44 of Ontario's Municipal Act, subsection 8, we have the following. No action shall be brought against a municipality for damages caused by A, the presence, absence, or insufficiency of any wall, fence, rail, or barrier along or on any highway. That section has been around since the 1930s. In 1939, uh, unfortunately, a young man was riding across a bridge where they had removed the railing and he went into the water and drowned. And the Court of Appeal upheld the trial decision against the municipal defendant, it was the county of Wentworth. After that, the law was amended. The municipalities said, Come on, how can you sue us for this? We took the railing off. It, you know, the kid went off. I mean, you know, it wasn't that there was a state of disrepair, we just didn't have a railing there. Nope. So what the, what the legislature did is it rewrote the law. It said, okay, no action will be brought against a municipality for damages caused by the presence, absence, which was the Groves case, or insufficiency of any wall, fence, rail, or barrier along or on any highway. Well, leave it to judges to come all the way back to finding a way to get around this. In several cases, the courts have held this section only applies where you don't have, and where they say the absence of a rail. They found a way to say that this section does not prevent liability for after you've decided to put the guide rail or barrier up, if it is in any way deficient. If it's not properly inspected or maintained, the courts have read down this section in such a way as to suggest you're not going to be um, immunized by this provision. Once you decide to put the guardrail or guide rail up, you got to maintain it. This section is not enough. And courts have, have tried to do it this way. They've said, well, the damages don't necessarily always arise from the existence of the guardrail. If it's, if it's in a hazardous state, that's what creates the danger. Not, not its mere presence, but the fact that it's improperly maintained. So it's, it's a distinction 
uh, that they've seized upon in many cases to uh, essentially render this the uh, the section meaningless uh, in large part. And um, the um, the other section B has been read by the courts only to mean when vehicles strike something off of the traveled portion of the roadway. And they've read down 448B for untraveled to mean um, where motorists could not reasonably have been expected to go as opposed to where motorists are not supposed to go. So that's a big difference because a motorist can be reasonably expected to end up just about anywhere on the highway if they're going fast enough. So judges know that, but they've, they've come up with a way to read down B. So 44, 8, and B, the bad news is if, if you build it, you got to fix it. That's the message. So it drives home the point, I think, quite clearly what our courts are going to do. Next slide, please. That's it. <laughs> the battle continues. That's me walking through the woods thinking about my next trial all by myself in the next couple of months. I'm out that the plaintiff's lawyers are hiding behind the trees, waiting to jump out with lawsuits to serve me with for, for the client side defense. So um, hopefully that helped uh, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Charles. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, we have a couple of quest general questions. Um, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but people are asking questions about today's presentation and I believe it's being recorded and will be um, shared with today's participants? It will. Okay. Um, panelists, a question maybe you guys can help. But there's a lot of questions in regards to training programs and where people can get more information. Does anybody want to take that question? I'm not a panelist, but I actually have an answer. Okay. <laughs> not surprising. Um, <laughs> OGRA is currently working with the uh, Road Safety Infrastructure Coalition, and we will be coming forward with an announcement around some training options. I think that specifically we will address the concerns that are, seem to be broadly raised, I think, by Charles's presentation, as well as by some of the questions in the chat room. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, we are certainly attuned to these concerns and are uh, it takes a bit of time to pull this together, but we will be uh, coming forward to the membership with some options that should satisfy those concerns. Yeah, Scott, it's my understanding that uh, a lot of the questions we have here will help guide future possible webinars. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you to all of our panelists today, and thank you for everybody who attended. Thank you, Scott and the and uh, Ontario Good Roads Association. Um, we thank you for your time today. Thank everyone. And again, be, just before we depart and for everyone at the hour mark, um, I would like to expressly thank the, the Road Safety Infrastructure Coalition for assembling this panel. Uh, it was visually interesting. It was rich in content. And I think it was really thought provoking. Uh, I'd also want to thank Frank Cowan uh, Company for their ongoing uh, sponsorship of OGRA. And, uh, you know, stay tuned. We'll have further uh, training opportunities and further information sessions available to you. Stay safe, everyone, and uh, stay healthy. See you soon. Thank you.